Hey, everybody. Welcome to Go to Your Room and Make Stuff, the podcast about making art, any kind of art, all by ourselves in a room or a studio, maybe outside. No one is telling us when, where, or how, or any combination of those things. This is a podcast for solo artistic adventurers, those who are doing it and those who want to try it. Support, ideas, and just plain fun. Hi, this is Abby Ekenizer. Thank you so much for coming on. I am thrilled you and I have bumped into each other in the weirdest, coolest places, including like the airport and Emerald Town. <laughs> and we haven't actually worked always in the same circles, but we work around each other. And I've been a fan yeah. for like ever. Paying attention. To what- I'm in your fan. What are you talking about? I came to you, remember? That's how we met. Oh, yeah. It's so cool. But I also, I, like this interview, I can't wait to ask you these questions because I want to know about all the projects that you're involved in, which is, is so cool. So before we mm-hmm. dive into the details, is sure. there a fun or unique fact that our listeners might not be aware of about you? Yes. Um, so I actually started off in, um, well, my creative space honestly started off with um, the Ren Fair, right? Um, okay. Being fairy <laughs> at the Washington State Renaissance Festival, Washington State Midsummer Renaissance Festival or Ren Fair, whatever. Fairy. <laughs> and I, I danced around Maple. <laughs> Is that the one that was in Snohomish? No, so they used to be in Gig Harbor. This was a long, long time ago before I even joined them. Um, and I joined them in 2009. Um, yeah, 2009, I joined them, or maybe it was 2010, I think. It was, and the way I got in was um, when I came here, I, okay, long story short, when I used to be active duty and I went home, um, one of my best friends would take me to the New York State Renaissance Fair. And I was like, what is this world? This is insane. I freaking love it. Everyone tries to speak British. It's great. Um, you know, everyone tries to talk in a British accent and it's so freaking lovely. Um, and it was fun. Like they saw people dress up as like satyrs and, you know, all kinds of like different creatures, ogres, you know, all of that stuff. Right. And like, that was, that was my world growing up. Like I was a huge D and D player. Um, we did magic gathering. And so seeing that, I was like, oh, this is fun. Then I moved to Washington because um, I was in the intelligence community um, and they had full-time support here in Washington as an active duty reservist. And so um, I had started working for the VA for my, you know, adult job. Um, and one of my coworkers was, heard me talking about rent fairs and all of that. And she's like, oh, we have a rent fair. Yeah, I work there as a barmaid and I was like what <laughs> I'm like, I'm the um and so obviously like all of the departments were full and so you know I was kind of like okay well what do I want to do do I want to be a-? no I don't really think I want to be a barmaid I have an, a, t- a 10 year old child I don't think I want him to see me walking around <laughs> with, with dollar bills in my boobs so right. <laughs> So um, I did the thing that I thought would make the most sense because he could be involved. Um, okay. And so I, I did, I did, uh, you know, I, I joined the Magic Guild, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, the Fay Guild, long and long. that was fun because he could be a brownie. I know, it's like, get the name, guys. <laughs> yep. Yep. My son In was, respect, you know. think about that when you go, yeah, you do change. That's how right. that. Yep. So, yep. so it was, it was so funny because he was a brownie. I was a fairy and they, they were like, oh, you should be like a fairy from the Unseely court because that's where the dark fairies are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, sure. That works. I can do that. That's totally fine. Um, knowing the history of Unseely fairies and all of that other stuff too. So I was just like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> so so I did that and um it was honestly one of the the best uh experiences that I ever had. Um it actually was the reason why I got into acting. Um, because again, another coworker that was in another um department uh, saw me uh, uh dancing around a maple and was like, You do this? And I was like, please don't tell me. <laughs> please. Right? 
um, because most of the people that I work with are like prior military, right? They're like mostly veterans or anything like that. And so I was just like, <laughs> uh, please don't tell anyone because I don't need to live this constantly yeah. over and over again at work and so he's like no no like i you know we're we're looking for like the agency that i'm a part of um they're looking for more actors of color um and you know it would be great to have you like join up and all this other stuff because you know i did have a love of acting like i, I did musical theater in university right um and yeah. so it was kind of like, okay, well, this is improv considerably, right? <laughs> so I was like, what is, what is this world? What is this like? I love, I absolutely love this. I'm, I'm having the best time. Um, yeah, let me do this audition. And so I did an audition and it was with um, Greg from Big Fish and, or Gregory okay. uh, from Big Fish. And um, yeah, this was a while ago. It was like 2013, I think, when he was there. And, um, I, I, you know, he's like, oh yeah, I think you'd be great doing like background stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, like just not knowing what that was all about, right? Like what's background, what's, what's principal, what is all of this stuff. And so, so I landed my first commercial as a Bartels commercial, um, with the really annoying blonde lady who did like, who was like the spokesperson for Bartels. Um, and and I, I think that was like the last commercial she did because it was so bad. It was so bad. The director had to constantly feed her her lines. Um, she was never on the spot where yeah. she needed to be. And I didn't understand any of that. You know, I was just like, oh my God. I don't remember you a TV, you're a TV person. You know, <laughs> like, I'm like, this is cool. But in doing that commercial, I, I met friends who are still friends till this day like david shea right from f theater who i love adore i adore david he's, so much he goes to everything bless him yeah yeah he's, like, all he, he's the one that he's the one that taught me how to do a selfie within a selfie because he started that he started that back in 2013 in my first commercial because we're doing selfies within a selfie on the bus the bus scene that we were in and i was like what is this is this are we are we allowed to do this <laughs> you know, like, i don't know we're background you know um and and david is like one of the people that like i know that i can talk to anytime and and call on and ask him to do anything and he's there right so we, um so i've known him probably the longest out of anybody else you know that i know here um and i appreciate that so much because uh who remembers actors and their first thing and and still keeps keeps in touch with that person right um yes. but yeah that's my weird roundabout way story of getting into acting first of all um but you know weird stuff that no one else would ever probably do because i am too old to prance around an ankle <laughs> so tell us about your art medium or medium so what do you what do you work on your plan um, so I think the thing that people don't realize when it comes to independent, independent film is that you just kind of have to play in so many different roles and see what you love the most. Right. Right. Um, I started off background, right. And it was like, oh, this is cool. And then I did principal and, um, you know, I wasn't really excited about a lot of the things that I was doing, right. The roles that I was getting, stuff like that. And so I was like, what, what does it look like? to do something else like do crew side right right um and so i started writing i started doing writing and, and we came out with uh one of our i think with the, one of the production companies that i used to work for um one of our most successful scripts which was called strollers um and that premiered at a ton of different film festivals and won a lot of awards, which, you know, I was very grateful for, but it wasn't my project. It wasn't something that I wanted to do. So um, I kind of did a deep dive and figured that um, I was very ADHD and neurodivergent and writing was hard <laughs> for me. Um, although I have some, you know, great scripts that are kind of just sitting on the shelf right now um that i just recently was told hey i want to see your script hey i want to you know do this with you so um those are potential things that could happen in the future but 
um, I, 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 I wanted to kind of advance a little bit more. And so I started directing and directed my first short film in 2020. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I think I feel like I, like I floundered a little bit, but I kind of found my feet directing and producing a documentary that I did about two years ago that ran its film festival circuit last year, won seven awards. Um, Congratulations. That's awesome. Most, most recent Cannes Arts Award um, for best directors. So I was Please. like, I was like, oh, oh, hair flip, hair flip. <laughs> I'll put a link. Are there ways people could find it? Absolutely. So um, we, we, we literally just talked to a distributor or sales agent two days ago um, <laughs> who is going to put it. But we do have um, a Vimeo behind a paywall right now so i can send you the vimeo link until you know distribution pending right um but yeah like who always who gets a chance to have a sales agent and do something you know where someone else is doing the work for you for distributing (laughs) um and it was such a beautiful meeting because he's like you know what i have two daughters and um i watched this film and like i can't tell you how beautiful it was to me and I was like okay that's gonna make me cry I actually yeah. I am crying you know like it was it was such a crazy meeting because like you think of sales agents as people who are just trying to get your money and and you know heartless people and they're just trying to make a dime you know and this guy first of all cut his fee in half for us um mm-hmm. and he's with clown circus media um and they do a yeah. lot of like hard-hitting um like like television projects uh BIPOC stuff you know so I was really excited about that um and then just like I said I was already like oh this guy's gonna be a jerk you know like that's it like like, that was my mindset and I jumped into the meeting and he was just like seriously like thank you for making this there you know there's no other political based films out there besides attack the block and there's two BIPOC women on there out of the three and only one woman wins their race and it's like that's yeah that's i because i watched it and i was like is there any other like political things out there and most of it is about men which you know yeah. kind of sucks but um i was i'm glad i was glad for the opportunity to make that um and so i've li- still been trying to find where i'm at and and i've been loving producing um and doing voiceover work obviously because I don't have to go out into the world, first of all. Well, well, it's, um, great. It's, great. it's great. Yeah, you know, it's great. I, I like, I love some of the voiceover projects that I've gotten a chance to do. I've done a lot of audio dramas with John Patrick Lowry, and I'm like, <laughs> but it's you. John, I have not done voiceover oh. with him. And I love this book that he wrote years ago. If you haven't read it, if you love fantasy, go find John Patrick Lowry's audio of the book he wrote. Okay, Dancing with okay. Eternity. Dancing with Eternity. It is so good. I'll put a link below. I Please. knew him already. I, I knew him. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll read it because I know John. About five pages in, I forgot all about John. I was just like, and I think I've read it three times. <laughs> is- well, I have it bookmarked already. Um, so I'm yeah. probably definitely going to buy that as soon as I get over here. That's the but, audio uh, book with Ellen and other people too, yeah. his wife. Is this so with I, Ellen? I, I, okay, because I love Ellen so much. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, when everything happened with my dad, she took over one of my classes and kept sending me these emails like, you take the time that you need. I love you. I appreciate you. And I'm just like, but you barely met me and you love me. I love you too. <laughs> you know, like, like I met Ellen a long time ago. Remind me Ellen's last name. For those of you listening, Ellen is a Gladios on Portal. I'll just yes. drop that. What's <laughs> Ellen's last name? This is terrible. I've yeah, John and so Ellen forever. forever. She's Ellen. Um, I remember. Oh, my goodness. Ellen was playing. I'm, I'm, please let me. <laughs> um, uh, and she she does the voice of Gladys. Like, yeah. You know, she's amazing, right? Um, And I absolutely adore her. Um, she doesn't do, you know, like, um, email or social media or anything like that, which is like, 
Well, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, um, Ellen McLean, um, yeah. that's M M C and then L A I N. And, yeah. um, I met her, <laughs> I actually met her oh, first time, long time ago. It was at a, my first, no, my second PAX party. Um, my friend Charlie Logan, I don't know if you know Charlie, he does voiceover stuff too. Um, but, uh, he was running a PAX party, like the PAX Pink Party, which was like the big party, one of the big parties that they did during PAX. Um, and um, Ellen was there. And at first, I'm like, Charlie, who do you and how do you know Ellen? Seriously, because I met you at a Doctor Who convention. Right. Um, actually, it was a MoCop Doctor Who event, not convention. It was Doctor okay. Who event. Um, and he was dressed up as um Peter Capaldi when Peter Capaldi first came out yeah. and so that that's history um and he's like he's like I see you do all of this stuff and I wanted you to be one of my judges because you're amazing so he had Ellen he had myself he had um uh Christian Nairn who plays Hodor on Game of Thrones um cool. and Finn uh I forgot his last name but he was um also in Game of Thrones Yes. He was the brother that like died really quickly from <laughs> from yeah. um you know King's Landing whatever I don't I don't remember his character thing but he was Iron Fist later right. on on Netflix um and so we're all like talking like up in the area and Ellen wasn't there but I'm talking to Christian Nairn like when we're talking about World of Warcraft and Finn and he's like like he hears my accent because it's very thick at the time and he's like where are you from and I was like oh I grew up in Clapham you know he's like. He's like, are you from Clapham? Fans from Croydon. And I was like, ooh, Croydon. He's like, ah, you got and, and he's like from Ireland, right? So he was just like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, going, hey, come on, wait, I can be someone from Clapham. And I was like, you're from Croydon? And he's like, I know. A lot of people <laughs> so, listening, folks listening to this don't yet hear your dialect. So yes. tell us where you were. So um, I was born in New Jersey. Um, okay. But I grew up in Clapham, England, um, and later on we moved to Stratford because Clapham was just getting so dangerous. Um, and so I spent a good part of my childhood there, um, and then I came back uh, to New Jersey, which is where my family is from, or at least where they like migrated to, because um, I'm first generation migrant family, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I came back, I was like this black person with a British accent and people were like, oh my God, what's wrong with your voice? You know, stuff like that. Um, um, and, then, and so I had that for a good chunk of time and like kind of learned earlier on that sometimes it's not good to be different, especially in a very non-diverse um, area, mainly, um, you know, uh, black people, right? Um, African Americans, and so um, you know, being someone who was different and all of that other stuff didn't always really fly well, especially in New York, New Jersey. Right. <laughs> um, so I kind of had to conform a bit, right? And and so my my American accent turned very valley for a little bit, um, and uh, was like that for a while, and then I got it back, like after I got out of the military, because. Um, I spend a lot of time in England. Like I was in uh, Menwith Hill, back and forth from Menwith Hill to Milden Hall, and that's the Royal Air Force Base that's over there. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of developed it again. And like you know, sometimes it comes out when I'm drinking or when I'm very angry, um, okay. and it's hard for me to get rid of it, um, for a bit. But you know, the one person who kind of like killed it was. Um, my agent, my first, my first principal agent here yeah. in Washington, you know, who told me, oh, it's really hard for you to be hired as like a voiceover person because they're, or like, even like, you know, on screen talent, because, you know, black people here don't have British accents. And I was like, huh? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, yeah. You know, and it was, so it was one of those things that I kind of had to phase out of my life, you know, if I was to get 
any type of gigs. And then here I'm with a new agency and it's like turned around. Like we need your accent all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I was like, okay, I'll give you the accent if you want it. Perfect for you're female, you have a British accent when you want one, and you're a person mm -hmm. of color. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. you are every agent in this country wants right now. All of them. <laughs> you know, and it, was, it was just really awesome. interesting to kind of have that, like, as a background history, you know. Um, so a lot of people were like, why didn't you have your accent? And I was like, oh, because I was told that I couldn't. <laughs> you know, oh, and, and this I, kind of derived from there. <laughs> This podcast is brought to you by the Seattle Voice Academy, and your host runs the podcast and the Seattle Voice Academy. This online voice school specializes in vocal health, singing, voiceover, and public speaking. Come check us out, seattlevoiceacademy.com. When you go to do your work, whether it's writing, all the stuff you do, do you have a studio, a voiceover, you have a studio. Where do you do your most creative work? Um, so I am lucky that I got to build my house, the house that I'm in right now. Um, I got to build my house. Um, yeah. I found this beautiful piece of property, designed it the way that I wanted it to be. Um, you know, and so for my voiceover stuff, I use my massive walk-in closet. Yeah. Um, and it is amazing because it's bigger than like, it's bigger than the booth that's at <laughs> any other school that I've been to, which is like, you know, not me bragging or anything, but, um, you know, I don't have a, an actual solid voiceover booth because I do so much and it's not something that takes up all of my time. Right. Um, but my room itself is very well soundproofed, which is great. Um, and I am lucky that I have a massive space to myself you know, because my fiance, he works during the day. Right. And so I am and I work from home with with my full time job. And so um, I have this ability to be at home and do all of the things that I need to do, whether it's working on a phone production or yes. you know, doing um, a voiceover project or or whatever. Um, I've also learned a lot of, um, you know, like work with John, you know, we hang out at Jack Straw Studio and I love that place so much because, oh. you know, we get to do stuff in a, like a round table, you know, yeah. round robin kind of thing, which I don't normally get to do. I don't normally get to react to other people. Um, so those opportunities are wonderful. Um, but my room is my creative space, like hands down, 100%. It is my safe space. It's where I can be as creative as I want to. It's where my ADHD doesn't always take over, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, when I'm here because um, I kind of feel, I don't know, the room just makes me feel grounded. I have everything that I want. I have a, I have a loo, I have my, my closet space, you know, if I, if I need privacy, you know, or anything. So, yeah. I think environment matters. I'm hearing this lovely buzzing. You should mention that you're in the middle of a bell project. And so um, Abby's phone is blowing up as we speak. I keep checking mine. I keep look, so looking sweet. at my wrist. And everything. Oh, no, take it. Because I'm just, uh, because she's in the middle of a project. When you're producing, you don't have a free 10 minutes to yourself. I don't. I really That's don't. So um, you came <laughs> In the middle of like, I keep checking my watch going, oh, it's not me. Oh, it's her. I, I honestly, I should have probably put this in Do Not Disturb. And I'm well, doing that now. But just the nice to thing make sure. Thing, if you want to go into film work and you're going to produce, this is really important that they're hearing your phone blow up. Because yes. I think I'm, sometimes producing is like surviving the phone buzzing, a no. bottle of acid, and a hammer. I, I, these are the three really things. Right. It's every time. Every time. Oh um, my and I love it. I, I I know that some people are just like, how do you do it? But right. and or we're like, you're always busy. And I'm like, but actually I'm not. You know, like I I I might look like I'm busy, but a lot of the stuff, especially when it comes to producing, like especially when it comes to pre-production, unless you're actually in like pre-production and production. You know, all of that time beforehand, you're not doing anything. The only reason, like, life has been a little bit busy recently is because I am getting married. 
Yes, congratulations. In less than a, in less than a month. <laughs> um, oh, wow. In the Poconos. <laughs> so it's a destination <laughs> wedding on top of that, too, right? I was um, too years ago next week yeah you know and it's and and we realize you know that like our friends here obviously it's really hard for them to come fly across the you know the united states to come and do this and so you know we we told ourselves that and we've been telling people hey like we're gonna do something here we're just doing the nigerian aspect of the wedding because yeah hell from nigeria um in in on the east coast because that's where all of my family his family is in ohio so it's a drive for them you know so yes. it just made sense and it was my dad's like last wish you know before yeah. he passed and so um it was just really important to like stay with that and uh, and we found a beautiful venue it's like 200 acres and like forty thousand square feet mansion <laughs> that will come to be at um for really inexpensive it was six thousand dollars a day so we're technically paying for our wedding party to stay there you know like we're literally (laughs) not paying that much money (laughs) and got married at a friend's property which brought the price way down but then we all dare come to the wedding Uh, that day actual ceremony it just knocked the flowers and some chairs down before had a ceremony and it came back that night of the bear in the wedding album yeah <laughs> i need to see these photos first of all <laughs> that is amazing um i'm really hoping that we don't have that because because yeah, yeah. i know in this area it's um it's amish country um and uh it's mount bethel pa it's right next to allentown okay yeah very close to the poconos about 20 minutes away uh, um and you know it's 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 a beautiful place really a lot of mixed culture there like when i told the venue that we were doing an Nigerian wedding they're like what's that yeah (laughs) Yeah. and yeah good it means good (laughs) they thought we were jewish and i was like no 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 we're not thank you yeah it was definitely gonna be (laughs) Do you have any mentors or people that really affected you over the last, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years? Oh, God, yes. Yes, 100%. Um, Nikkei Imaru, who's one yes. of the top casting directors here. Um, hands down, one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Um, she's the sweetest person and anytime I have any questions or concerns or thoughts, um, acting questions, th- things like that, she is phenomenal. Yes. Um, I absolutely adore her and she's such a strong, um, black woman that, um, she's someone to aspire to, you know, um, I, I, I absolutely adore her and I try to keep, I try to keep my mentors people who I, I know mainly because there's the easy access that's there. And then you can follow a lot of the things that they do without having to deal with social media too much. Right. Right. Um, because I'm neurodivergent. Um, and I just actually, um, met someone recently who has been a huge mentor to me, Claudia Black, um, who I got to work with uh, a couple of months ago. Um, back in December, I got to work with her. Um, she's very, very neurodivergent, very ADHD and 100% promotes that. And to have someone who's up there, who is so adamant about, um, that silent disability, um, it's, it's just been a whirlwind knowing her and like, you know, having her send me messages every once in a while, just checking in, how are you doing? You know, have you yeah. come up with like any new things? Let me talk about it. And I'm like, like my life is so busy right now. I wish I could. I want to, but you know, like, you know, I've, I've, I've had to pivot a lot with a lot of the things that I love to used to do, you know, compared yeah. to now. And so, um, definitely her, she is a freaking firestorm and windstorm. 
all at once because because she's vibrant and and alive and beautiful and you know i love the short weekend that i got to spend with her um because i was i was her um celebrity celebrity handler at an event um that she was doing and um even though she wasn't in love with the event she was very much in love with me and that is all that i care about (laughs) you know um literally all i care about um but I, i would have to say hands down um i mean mentors come and go and they are the people that i i i kind of call on right now um, as much as I possibly can, because they are at their easy access. Um, yes. and I love it. You know, there's, there's not that many people that I can be like, Oh my God, I love you. And I want to like talk to you all the time, but I know that I can't, cause I know that you're busy and I, I, I would feel like I'm disrupting your life. <laughs> you know, if I tried to like talk to you <laughs> or anything. So, so yeah, you know, I so, just, I, I love that very much. I love that they're accessible and everything. How do you, how do you handle social media critiques? How do you handle that stuff for your projects? Oh, can you repeat the question? Cause there was a pause. <laughs> so how do you handle critiques, opinions, social media, that stuff? Okay. Um, so critiques, yeah. I, I usually take them personally. Um, but that's because I'm always trying to better myself as a creative. Um, and so if I feel like someone is telling me something, I, I look inside myself and, and actually try to figure out what I can do to make it better. You know, I don't yeah. come try to come to a, I mean, I, I do try to like come to a compromise um a good chunk of the time but not most of the time you know what can i do um because as creators we're always hypercritical of ourselves and so um it's really hard to not take it personally um because that's your work that's who you are you know and your work reflects you as a person um and so i try to do what i can especially when it's about me and what i'm doing to try to better it as quickly as I can um, and explain why things were done the way that they were too, right? Um, for social media, um, oh my goodness, I am such a, a activist. <laughs> um, a lot of my social media is very much, what can I do to better my place, my, my space um, for myself and for my kid when I'm not here anymore. And, um, you know, yeah. we had the protests and the protests happened and, I was very key involved in all of that. Um, you know, we had the women's movement that happened when Roe v. Wade was overturned. I was very key involved yes. in that. Um, you know, my social media is very important to issues that are just yesterday. You know, I shared a petition, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, I shared a petition about how um city of Seattle was trying to take $51 million from the Black arts community. Um, that they wanted to place somewhere else. And I know where that place was, but I'm not going to say because we're not going to make this controversial. But <laughs> yeah. um, it had everything to I do with the you. protest. Uh, don't worry. Go look at yeah. that later because it's important. It is very important. Uh, two council members who I thought were very key to the development of film and equity here in Seattle um, were the ones that proposed the bill. And I was really upset to see that. Um, and, you know, doing what I can to make sure that I'm sharing that information as much as possible um, is very key and important to me. Um, having friends yeah. who are in, involved in those spaces is very key and important to me. You know, so having people share that information you know, like we, we found out about it, like in the evening. And I was like, I need to post this on my Facebook so it gets visibility. And as soon as I did the next day, I found out that we got the signatures that we needed and people were like abhorred to find out that the city council was trying to do this, you know? Um, so I was glad for that. Um, and, but like I said, you know, everything, everything that I've ever done, um, has everything to do with being as socially active as possible because the world needs to change and it is not done changing. And whatever we can do to f- 
fix that <laughs> um, and continue it and fight for those people who can't fight. Um, I'm so, so adamant about that. Um, do you I, do, I do get to yeah. share my projects too, you know, the projects that I think are really important. Uh, but most of the time it's people tagging me and stuff and, and sharing things that I've done. And would <laughs> so. you say, would you like to use your art to also further those messages? Absolutely. Oh God. Yes. One hundred percent. I mean, like I said, the the documentary that I did was literally about women of color running for political offices, and six yep. out of eight of those women won their their office seats. Um, okay. Include including yep. um, Lisa Mannion from uh, King County District Prosecutor. Um, you know, Mona Doss was the forty seventh district senator. Um, yes. You know, and that's a Hartman who's out in Oregon who had to deal with Proud Boys almost every what single day. In her hard one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was, it's so important to me to have that. Um, one of the short films that I wrote is, is about Roe v. Wade, you know, and the decision to, to have the ability to be pro choice or not to be pro choice. Um, you know, another, uh, the current project that I have going on right now um, is called Sticky Buns, White Cake and Ravioli. Um, and it is, an, it is a short film concept from Her Mad Hatter, which was a book written um, years ago. Um, and the feature we hopefully plan on shooting um, September, October of this year, we're doing this concept short film, obviously to have investors involved. But it deals cool. with BIPOC mental illness, you know, and and um, how to seek um, help when it comes to having yep. a mental illness and what that looks like, what that mental illness could potentially do to the world around you, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the first time I've ever gotten a chance to work on a virtual production. Um, we're going to be shooting in front of a huge LED studio. Um, at Bossler in Kirkland. It is an 84 yeah. foot LED processing studio. Um, and I am beyond excited because I don't know how many people can say that they've done this or have been involved in anything. Yeah. Like this. So, so yeah, we get to do that tomorrow. That's a 12 hour shoot. Um, we have a key amazing team that's involved. Um, and I can't wait to work with a lot of them again. You know, a lot of them I brought onto this project from previous projects that I got a chance to work on. And, um, and right now, um, you know, that's going to be a long day, but I pr I'm producing yeah, that. So I'm super excited to, to be able to say that I'm producing something like that. Um, another thing that I am involved in that we just launched the Kickstarter for, for all of the role-playing game people that are out there. Um, and I cannot finally say it, I'm not under NDA anymore, <laughs> is um, we have launched um, Gamers for the Series, which is, per Mary Sue, the Mary Sue, one of the best D&D movies that has been out to this day, compared to any other D&D movie that has been out there. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it has been running for about 23 years. It's been, um, in, in, you know, in, in the world. Um, there is a beautiful cult following <laughs> that is involved. Um, yes. some of the big named people that we have, um, is, uh, uh, executive producers from Con Man, the television show. Um, with yeah. Alan Tudyk and Nathan Fillion. Um, we have Paizo that is behind this production, which is one of the big Pathfinder production places right here in yes. Washington State. Um, yes. And we are so lucky um, to have it shared by so many big comic book creators, um, a number of people who are interested in being involved in the production. Um, we're bringing back Chris Mazio, who was the director of photography from the original Gamers um, series shows, and Kevin Inoue, who was the fight choreographer for a lot of the fast-paced, fast-hitting scenes <laughs> that were involved. Um, and people can go to YouTube and just look up Gamers um, hands of fate or gamers the series 
um, to be able to watch some of the previous stuff. But I showed it to my fiance who never knew about the show. Um, and he's just like, this is the funniest crap I have ever watched in my entire life. So the fact that stuff 20 years ago still holds true and holds up to this day um, because it fights sexism, especially in the gaming community. You know, um, you know, women gamers, Gamergate, all of that, right? Like literally is, it fights all of that. So I'm so yeah. happy to be in, involved in a project. The original writer, Matt Vansel, is involved in this. Um, we've already yeah. raised over $100,000. Our goal is five hundred. dollars um, We have 31 days left. <laughs> <laughs> we are at a hundred thousand dollars so okay. over a hundred thousand so yeah um, so when you and then you have, have, right oh go yeah. ahead sorry <laughs> just telling everyone they should go on right now and give money to this project now yes <laughs> yes if they literally go to kickstarter look up gamers for it, it's an easy search it's one of the top searches that have been happening recently um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and then I have like one more production that I'm associating producing on in Bainbridge called Detention. Yep. And it is a modern take on the most beautiful movie ever made, The Breakfast Club. I want to see that. Like, that <laughs> I can't wait. To see. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. So you have a lot of irons in the fire. Um, yeah. One question I definitely want to ask you, though, if someone were new, if they were a kid or an adult who wants to start being more creative, mm -hmm. what advice would you um, the beautiful thing about that is that, um, I am vice, vice president of an organization, especially for BIPOC kids, um, who are interested in getting involved in film, getting okay. involved in creation, all that stuff. It's called Rising Reels. Um, and we're okay. sponsored through the city, um, for the past couple of years, actually, um, to hold classes, teach things to kids. They get their own camera, video camera, and they can literally go around and just shoot content all of the time. Um, yes. it, it, if they go to the website, risingreels.org, um, they'll be able to find out a ton of information about that. Um, and that's, and that's an easy path right there. Um, yeah. if they had questions or thoughts or concerns, they can always send me a message. I am always available to answer any kind of questions whatsoever. Um, because it is a process. This is an arduous process. There are a lot of things that I had to learn that I wasn't excited about learning um, along the way. Um, most important thing is have your friends sign contracts <laughs> all of the time. Um, it is so important well, to protect yeah. you, to protect them um, you know, things. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and if you want to get into the world of being creative, be creative. Follow the path that, that enlightens you as much as possible and have fun with it. And don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't. Don't ever, ever, ever. I can't tell you, as, as a Nigerian-born, um, a firstborn child, um, my parents didn't, did not think the world of film or creation or, or creative works was uh, lucrative at all. Um, I think you've probably heard this right. from any international parent. Um, you need to be a doctor, lawyer, or an engineer. That's it. You don't get any, you don't get choices to do anything else, you know? And so um, my whole process was being creative when I was very young. It was very important to me. And, and, and I stayed on that path and I stayed true to that path as much as I possibly could. Not with the, not always with the support of my parents, you know, later on, yes. But in the beginning, definitely not. And and you're going to get that, you know? So it's just really important to to continue to fight as much as you possibly can and and continue being creative because we need, we need so many people. Um, you know, I feel like the creative industry is slowly um, dwindling and it's so important to keep minds not cornered to be able to explore out into the world and do whatever you want to do and have fun, you know, doing it. So stay true to yourself. Oh, I love that. Abby, thank you so much, so much for coming on during your incredibly busy schedule. May your filming tomorrow be, have a great time tomorrow and take aspirin. Uh, at least I don't know. Yes. Uh, may you sleep more fun again someday. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> Abby, thank you so, so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
<laughs> Let me hit. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Go to Your Room and Make Stuff, the podcast for artists of any kind who want to make art by themselves. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast in all the places where you find podcasts. Find us on social media. And if you ever have any artists you would like to see featured, please let us know. Now, go to your room and make stuff. <laughs>